My name is Brooke Long, and I am a two-time breast cancer survivor. I was first diagnosed with my breast cancer in 2016 when I was 33 years old. Like a little pea frozen under the skin is what it felt like to me. I could shift it around, and I knew right then that I had to go check out myself. But before that moment, I had no family history, no knowledge of any family history. I was later diagnosed a month later with a stage two invasive ductal carcinoma. My breast cancer was no longer contained. It had moved into my lymph nodes and was through the lymph lymphatic system, it can travel the body and get into the blood. Grading means when you look at how aggressive the cancer is. So grading is different than staging. And I was a grade three, which meant out of a one to three grade, it was like, the most aggressive grade that it could replicate itself the fastest. I think the, the, the feeling that you get when you're first diagnosed is, for me, it was insatiable curiosity. I needed to ask a million questions and I needed to know what the plan was to survive it. And the mistake we all make first is to go on Google. And my big advice is stay off the Google machine don't go there because the information on the internet is unfiltered. The first thing I needed to do was treat it like a job. Create an A-team of doctors and healers around you that can guide you. So you look for, and maybe get second and third opinions, you look for people who are going to advocate for you as much as you will and who are the top of their game. Enlist someone to help you advocate for yourself so that they can take the notes with you. And that meant that in my, my worried state of mind, I didn't mishear what the doctor was saying. And the second thing I would say to someone who is newly diagnosed is that your story, your cancer story and your treatment is your own and this is gonna manifest for you in a unique way, and it's, it is your own. That's the number one thing that gave me power to feel it settled my heart. I can really take control of certain aspects of the healing that I want to do, and I can make it my own stories. Mine was a stage two, I had a plan, but I still felt that my time was precious and my time was fleeting. Anyone who receives a cancer diagnosis is scared of death. That's something that's not out of the picture, you know, that can happen. That fear for yourself makes you protect the time you have more fiercely. And learning how to say no is something that you have to learn really early on in a cancer diagnosis. Work hard to create a space for healing. So my mantra to myself was, how do I create a healing environment in my mind and body? And then, how do I create a healing environment in my surroundings? And that includes the home or the actual environment you're in and also your, the company you keep. I downloaded this app on my phone called Headspace and it taught me how you can just focus on your breath for a minute, exercising the muscle to clear the mind, clear the mind, and you, you make the mistake and you come back to that just clearing the mind and you make the mistake again and that's the muscle is that you just keep coming back to breathing, focusing, and clearing. The point is to create distance and space between the thought and your reaction. And that was how I survived a lot of the meetings, the, the, the stressful, doctor's appointments, the times when I was feeling symptoms that were out of con my control, the things that made me the most scared. I kept going back to creating a healing environment in my mind through meditation. And I noticed that on the days that I incorporated movement into my life, so even a, just a walk, because in the beginning you have like dinosaur arms after a double mastectomy and you can't pick things up. So even just going on a walk and like breathing really deep and stretching my chest helped me create fluidity in my muscles and help me feel more like myself and help me get out of my head and back into my body and think about, okay, this is a healing environment for my body. And I started looking at what do I put on my skin and what do I put in my, you know, what am I, what is in my makeup? And some of my favorite makeup had crazy things in it, like silicones and preservatives, like parabens are preservatives. 
that are linked to cancer. And I was like, all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I can't have that. Or there was formaldehyde in my beloved nail polish. And I started realizing we have to make this so easy for my body to heal that I can't give it formaldehyde or parabens or anything that's gonna like distract from the healing. And then the food, the food I think is probably number one, number one. So I started to get the help of professionals to eat in this way that would create a healing environment in my body. And I started to feel like pretty amazing. And all the symptoms, I noticed the days that I ate really pretty healthy, the symptoms felt totally manageable. Spending time with animals and children was a big part of healing for me. So this is my dog Lola and she, you know, trying to just stay in the present moment and not be transported into an anxious moments. And like dogs, they only know what's right in front of them and children are the same way. And I think it's so healthy to just be in the present moment and cultivate gratitude for just exactly what you have now this one precious life in this one moment. Don't be carried away into the future. The, the Japanese have this concept called forest bathing, where you go into the forest and you just let the sounds of nature and the feeling and the colors and the, the processes that you see heal you. And that was just exactly how it felt for me. It, and I would start to take long walks and surround myself with more plants. Like my house has like a million plants now because it's a healing environment for me to have nature around. It's a lonely place to be to receive tough news and it's scary, um, but that doesn't have to be the outcome. And I needed, I needed people around me to just give me a lot of grace and the ability to process what I was feeling and metabolize what I was feeling. And I decided to seek the help of a therapist, and that was one of the best decisions of all time. A talk therapist, I met with her weekly. As soon as I could put into words what I needed, and I figured out what I needed, and I told people, they were relieved. They were like, oh, we're so glad that you taught us how to treat you. That is frustrating as a patient because you're like, oh, I'm already going through a lot. Do I also have to give someone a lesson and how to talk to me and how to treat me and support me? But actually that is, it's, you do. And you will receive the benefit of that healing if you do. I found this article that was written by Susan Silk and she's a, a, a therapist who developed the Silk Ring Theory. And I would say this for anyone going through any trauma. And I staged this press release with my husband on Facebook and Instagram and by email to our best friends and family that said, okay, hey everyone, we're in trauma. Please read this article. Please get familiar with the silk ring theory and send comfort in and dump out. Um, and that just nipped everything in the bud. I stopped receiving like the fears of other people that quashed my ability to be strong. And I started just receiving love and comfort and support that was so empowering. I got the most help from three types of books. So I found this woman called Pema Chodron. She's a Buddhist nun and she practices sitting with uncertainty, sitting with discomfort. And then the second book that helped me was books Poetry from Nature by Mary Oliver. She writes things that made me feel connected to the universe in the greater whole. Um, and then the third was transportive stories. So I reread Memoirs of a Geisha, which is like a really lush, beautiful book that helped me get my mind off things when I needed a pointed distraction. You get the support in the beginning and then it kind of tapers off. And I think it's so, meaningful to have someone acknowledge and you really feel seen or heard if someone acknowledges you down the road but you can never misstep if if you're saying something that is just loving and kind so you can never misstep if you say i'm thinking of you or i saw this and i thought of you today or how are you feeling today? That word today inserted at the end of how are you feeling makes it feel like better because how are you feeling? You're feeling terrible. But how are you feeling today makes it feel like that person knows that it changes day by day. You know, you can say, 
I love you and you're so loved. The things that we, the big things we need in life are the same things that we need in difficult times, are the same things we need on our deathbed, which are to feel that we are loved, to be forgiven, and know that it's okay, whatever, I did it, I did enough, I did the best I can, um, I'm forgiven for my faults, it's okay. And then the third being that you'll be remembered or you have some kind of legacy or people think of you. And those three things, like we need right now in our everyday lives, we need to feel connected, we need to feel loved, and we need to feel like it's okay and that we're doing our best. But we really need them when it's hard. Cancer is becoming less of a death sentence and more of a chronic illness. This is the beauty of modern medicine now is, is we are learning new ways of facing the disease, new treatments that are less radical or less harmful for your body. You can live really well with cancer and treat it like you would any other chronic illness like diabetes. And that's super encouraging to me. I want to be part of that new paradigm of chronic illness, cancer as chronic illness instead of cancer as death sentence. And I think more and more people will live well with cancer and they can be encouraged by that and keep seeking treatment even when someone tells you that this is the end of the road. It never is.